All right. Thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Stephen Bucklin. Welcome to my presentation called Fascinating Fall Fungi. Um, a little bit about me. I'm a naturalist educator for the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy, and I have a Bachelor of Science in Ecology from Penn State, and I'm also an identifier for the Western Pennsylvania Mushroom Club. Um, so I'm really fascinated by fungi, um, and I've been studying them pretty intensely for about four or five years now. Um, and I'm really excited to share some things that I've learned with all of you. Uh, the plan for this presentation is to go over some of the um, basics of what fungi are doing out in our ecosystems, um, and then present 10 species that you're likely to see um, this fall here in Pittsburgh's parks. And then uh, I've actually got some specimens that I collected over the weekend that I'd like to share with you all at the end as we do some uh, questions and answers. So that's the plan for this. It'll be about a 40 minute presentation and then we'll get into um, some discussion. So kingdom fungi is an incredibly diverse uh, group of organisms. There's an, about 120,000 species that have been described, but that's only a small fraction of the total number of species estimated to exist on Earth. Um, most of these fungi don't produce mushrooms. Um, they're microscopic organisms that live inside of plants, inside of animals like you and I. Um, or in the soil, or even underwater. Um, but a select few uh, are able to produce these large um, macroscopic fruiting structures called mushrooms. Um, in North America, there's an estimated 10 to 12,000 different species of mushroom forming fungi. And here in Pennsylvania, we have at least 3,000 different species. So fungi, play really critical roles in the ecosystem. They're involved in the decomposition of 90% of the organic material on Earth. And that's including um, marine and aquatic environments as well as terrestrial environments. Many of these fungi have intimate relationships with plants, providing plants with water and nutrients, or even acting as part of their immune system and defending that plant from bacteria or parasitic fungi. Here's just a sampling of some of the diversity. So fungi can be broken up into a couple different groups based on the forms they take. So there's a whole bunch of species under each one of these categories. There's lots of different crust club and coral fungi, cup fungi, puffballs and earth balls, jellies, um, brackets or shelf-like mushrooms. And then there's a whole lot that form kind of a cap and a stem, and they can be separated out into a couple different groups as well. Um, the gilled mushrooms are probably the most abundant of these cap and stem mushrooms. These are things like your classic portobello, or white button mushroom that you get at the grocery store. Um, but there's a whole lot of other species as well. Um, then you've got things like chanterelles and trumpets, um, boletes, which are like the gilled mushrooms, but instead of having gills on their underside, they've got all these tiny pores. Um, so that's pretty cool. We've got some spine fungi. They've got little teeth on the underside instead of gills or pores. And then you've got the morels um, and some similar looking species. So all of these diversity of forms of mushrooms exist for one purpose, um, which is to disperse spores to another suitable place where that, um, that fungus could create a new individual 
um, and continue the species. So this is an example of a fungal life cycle. When a spore lands somewhere, it germinates, and if it is able to, to meet with a compatible, um, compatible hyphae from the same species, then they can fuse and form a mycelium or a network of threads that go through um, whatever that fungus is digesting. So fungi are a lot more closely related to animals than they are to plants. They consume things just like we do, but they digest it on the outside of their body, which is all these tiny threads of mycelium, and then absorb the nutrients um, that they've digested. Uh, so then eventually that mycelial network can form a fruiting structure, um, which would release more spores into the environment. So this is an example of kind of your classic gilled mushroom life cycle. Other fungi have much more complex life cycles, but this kind of breaks down the, the basic parts of that. I wanted to spend a lot of time during my talk today talking about the ecological roles of fungi. And most of the uh, mushrooms that we find can be broken down into three, three categories. Um, so we've got saprotrophs. Those are um, the decomposers. So they're gonna be breaking down organic material um, typically woody debris. Sapro means dead or decaying, and troph means to gain nourishment from, so they're gaining their nourishment from dead or decaying material. Then you've got your biotrophs and necrotrophs. Um, so these are mushrooms or, or fungi that are either consuming living things or um, killing living things and consuming them. So a classic example is the cordyceps mushroom. So here is cordyceps militaris, um, and it parasitizes the pupae of a number of different um, lepidopterans, so butterflies and moths, and produces fruiting bodies from the, the pupa of those insects. Uh, and then another really important ecological role that fungi fulfill is a symbiotic role. A lot of mushroom species are what's called mycorrhizal. So they grow in association with the roots of a number of different plants um, and are able to share nutrients and water with that plant in exchange for sugars. And they're actually able to connect plants to each other and create a network underground um, that allows plants to share nutrients with each other as well. And then I wanted to share a little bit about some of the different types of rotting that can happen from saprotrophs. So you can further break down the saprotrophic fungi into brown rotters and white rotters. Um, and the effects that they have on wood are pretty interesting. So if you look here on the left, you've got brown rot. Um, and that is also called cubicle rot because it creates these sort of cubic structures in the wood. And what you're seeing here is a log where a fungus has come and it has degraded all of the cellulose in that log. Um, so trees, they're, they're woody and they're able to have that hard wood structure from a couple different um, compounds. So lignin and cellulose, are two compounds that help form those rigid cell walls and help form that woody material. So brown rot fungi are degrading that cellulose and leaving the lignin behind. So the lignin is a little bit brown in color and so that's why it's called brown rot. Um, white rot fungi have a totally different effect on wood. Uh, they degrade the lignin and leave the cellulose behind so it kind of bleaches the, the wood and, and leaves just this whitish color. Um, and both of these um, processes are really, really important 
for the, the health of forest ecosystems. They, they help to build healthy soils. Um, this, especially this brown rotted wood, as it breaks down, it crumbles into a powder and becomes part of the soil. And um, it's able to hold on to moisture a lot better than uh, other components of the soil. And um, so yeah, both of those are just really beneficial for uh, the health of the soil. So that was just a little bit about the ecological roles that fungi can play. So now I'm gonna get into sharing 10 um, different species you're likely to see in the parks this fall, or at least it's possible you could see them in the parks this fall. Um, so how I chose what to share, um, I went through iNaturalist and used some of the filters on iNaturalist to just show me um, what, what types of mushrooms are fruiting in October and November, specifically in the city of Pittsburgh. Um, so I, that generated a list for me of kind of the most common species here in the city. But then I kind of narrowed it down to things that I was particularly interested in, things that I had seen before, um, or that I thought fit into this kind of fall season. So yeah, I'm gonna share some species profiles with you. So the first one I wanted to share is Chicken of the Woods, Lataporus sulfurius. This is a really incredibly beautiful mushroom um, and it's really common even in urban areas. Um, to identify this mushroom, it's fairly easy. This is considered one of the, one of the easier mushrooms to learn as a beginner. Um, it's got bright orange on the top and underneath it'll have a pore surface that is bright yellow. Um, so if you flip this mushroom over, it won't have gills like a portobello mushroom, it'll have a pore surface. So it'll have all these tiny holes in the underside and a bright yellow underside. Um, it usually grows in overlapping shelves like this. And this is a, a really cool mushroom to find growing because it is a brown rot fungus. So it is creating that cubicle rot we were looking at before um, and adding to the health of the soil as it breaks down the wood in trees. Um, I usually find it growing on oak and cherry trees, but it can also be found growing on other hardwood trees. And related species can be found growing on conifers as well. So Lataporus huroniensis, is found in our region, mostly growing on hemlock, but I think it can also grow on pine. All right, the next species here is the funeral bell or the deadly gallerina, gallerina marginata, um, fitting into our fall theme. Halloween's coming up, so I tried to pick out some things that were like, kind of spooky, and what's spookier than a deadly mushroom? <laughs> so this one is a kind of typical little brown mushroom. Sometimes you'll hear people talk about LBMs, stands for little brown mushroom. Um, the cap can get to be fairly big, it, about two and a half inches. Um, it's brown, and really the identifying features you wanna look for is it can be a little sticky or slimy when it's wet, and it should have um, a, oftentimes it'll have a remnant of a partial veil around the stem. So if you look at the stem, you might notice a white or brown ring going around the stem near where um, the cap would have been attached to it when it was immature. Um, so, this mushroom will have kind of a cobwebby covering over those gills when it's immature that disappears and leaves behind a ring zone. Um, and as the spores mature, uh, the gills go from this whitish color or yellowish color to a rusty, rusty brown color. This mushroom has rusty brown spores. So if you take a spore print of this, if you cut the stem off and set the mushroom on a piece of paper, and put a cup or a bowl over it and leave it there for 
a few hours. It'll deposit its spores on the paper and you should be able to see um, this really beautiful rusty brown color. Um, it creates a really neat pattern of um, kind of exactly how the gills are laid out on the underside. Um, if you've never made a spore print, it's a really fun thing to do uh, with the mushrooms that you collect. Some people will even make art out of them. So yeah, rusty brown spores, that ring zone, um, and it usually grows on moss covered logs. That's usually where I find it. Uh, the toxins in this are amatoxins, the same um, compounds that are found in the poisonous ammonita mushrooms like the death cap and the destroying angel. Um, so these toxins destroy your liver uh, and slowly um, kill you. Uh, <laughs> it's a pretty serious mushroom that you don't want to mix up with things that you're collecting for the frying pan. Um, yeah. Oh, one other thing I wanted to share, the way that am amatoxins affect your body is that they inhibit um, RNA polymerase II, which is essential for your cells to build proteins. Um, so it basically just shuts down the functioning of your cells. So it tends to target your liver and your kidneys, um, but it can also damage other organs in your body. All right, the next species I wanted to share is the jack-o'-lantern. Some of you might be carving pumpkins or getting ready to carve a pumpkin this month. Um, this mushroom gets its name from its orange color and also the fact that it glows in the dark. It's one of a couple bioluminescent species that grow in Southwest PA. Um, some identifying traits on this one, it's a really bright orange to yellow color um, and the gills will come down the stem a little bit. They're what's called subdecurrent. So you can see in this picture here, the gills are ever so slightly coming down the stem, tapering down the stem. Um, this one usually grows in clusters at the base of a tree. Um, sometimes you'll find it in the middle of a open area growing from the roots of a dead tree. So this one's a saprotroph, um, decomposing woody material. This one is also toxic. Um, it smells delicious. If you ever find this mushroom and, and pick it, um, it has a really fruity smell, um, but you do not want to consume this one. I've heard stories that It'll have you uh, feeling not very well for a long time. Basically, you'll wish you were dead, but you won't be. So it doesn't sound like a fun time. All right. The next one I wanted to share with you is Pinellus stipticus, the bitter oysterling. Um, this is a pretty nondescript mushroom, pretty small, um, but it has an incredible property, uh, being that it glows in the dark. So to identify this mushroom, you wanna look on logs. This one is also a saprotroph, um, typically on broadleaf trees. So all the, all the trees that are changing color right now, losing their leaves, um, this one, will decompose the woody material from those trees. So it's kind of a tan to brownish mushroom and it'll turn whitish in spots as it gets older. So you can see in this picture, there's some whitish on some of these mushrooms down in this corner. Um, it's kind of semicircular to kidney shaped and fairly small, so it's Rare to see them over an inch wide. Typically, they're a little smaller than that when I find them. Um, they've got a short stem that's off-centered. Um, sometimes it'll be laterally attached. Sometimes it'll come in under the mushroom, but be off-centered. 
and um, the stem is slightly hairy if you're able to look at it with a hand lens. Um, you can kind of see it's textured in this picture, but if you look up close, it'll have a little bit of fuzz there. Um, if you were to taste the flesh of this mushroom, it would be very bitter or astringent. That's part of where it gets its common name from. And supposedly it is used, it has been used as a styptic to stop bleeding. So that's where its species epithet comes from. So yeah, one of the Mushroom Club members, Josh Doty, got this picture um, earlier this week, I think, of this mushroom glowing in the dark. Pretty cool photo, so I wanted to share that with you all. All right, the next species I wanted to share is one of the most common mushrooms in North America. This is the turkey tail mushroom or Tremedes versicolor. Uh, this is actually a pretty difficult mushroom to describe in terms of its color because there's so many different colors that it can be found um, expressing. So it's a thin, flexible, shelf-like mushroom. Um, it can be fan-shaped to kidney-shaped, and it's often fused together. Um, so you'll find multiple caps of this kind of fused together, growing in um, overlapping shelves in this pattern here. Um, what's always consistent with this mushroom is it has overlapping, or not overlapping, concentric zones of color. So you'll notice it's got these bands of different colors. Um, so often it'll have white or a yellowish color at the very edge, and then it'll have different shades of other colors as you go along the cap. So this one here is kind of a bluish gray color, but then there's some streaks of red um, and like blackish. This one over here is more of like brown with some cinnamon hues to it. So a lot of different colors. And another interesting thing is it has um, zones of texture that usually line up with the colors. So uh, as each, color ring changes, you'll also notice a change in the texture of the cap of the mushroom. Um, so some parts of it will be really, really fuzzy. So if you rub your thumb across this mushroom, it'll feel like velvet. Um, but other parts will be a little smoother. Um, so if, it's a really fun one to look at with a hand lens and, and notice that pattern of the, the matching up of the concentric zones of color and texture. Um, but really, to tell this one um, apart from related species, you need to look at the underside. So the pore surface on this one should be white, and it won't bruise. Like if you um, kind of squish it or run your fingernail across it, it won't turn color. It'll stay white. Um, and the pores on this are very, very tiny. So you might not even realize it has pores when you first look at it. Um, so you might need to get out a, a hand lens or a magnifying glass and look really closely, but there should be um, three to eight pores per millimeter. And uh, that should help you separate it from some lookalikes. There's a lot of different species of Tremedes that grow around here. Um, they are all uh, saprotrophs, wood decomposers, um, typically of broadleaf trees. Uh, an interesting thing about turkey tail is I've recently seen this one growing on um, bush honeysuckle. So bush honeysuckle is an invasive plant that um, is pretty common in a lot of our urban parks. And I've noticed this one decomposing the branches of bush honeysuckle that are left behind after uh, some of our stewardship crews have gone through and, and removed those shrubs from an area. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, this mushroom is really well adapted to digesting a lot of different woody material. It's also reported to have medicinal properties. Um, some people collect this and make tea out of it, um, but a lot of research still needs to be done on the, the chemical compounds within this mushroom 
to determine how effective they are as medicine. Mostly I think it has antioxidant properties um, that are probably beneficial. And just to, to show you a couple more examples, Can you all see my web browser that I pulled up? Cool. So this is uh, Michael Kuo's website. It's called mushroomexpert.com. It's a really great resource if you want to learn more about identifying mushrooms. And this just goes to show some more of the... Uh... Sorry about that. Uh, some of the variety in, in these mushrooms. So you can see some of the colors. It's a very diverse mushroom. And Michael Quo has this uh, totally true turkey tail test on his website here. So if you ever find a mushroom and you're like, this might be a turkey tail, you can come back here and go through this series of questions to figure out if you have a totally true turkey tail. Um, because there really are a lot of look lookalikes. Um, the first lookalike that a lot of people encounter and mistake for turkey tails is Sterium ostrium. This is commonly called the false turkey tail. But you can see on this one, this is what the underside looks like. It's kind of smooth, no pores, and kind of orangish or brownish in parts. But the true turkey tail, I don't know if you can see here, it's got pores and a whitish surface. So just wanted to show some more examples for that one because it can be confusing. There's a lot of similar looking species. All right. So next up here is Hyphaloma Lateritium or the brick cap. This is a really beautiful mushroom. Um, it can be a deep brick red color. Um, sometimes it's a little orange instead of red. And towards the outside of the cap, you can notice in this picture it's getting a little pale and yellowish. Sometimes you'll find mushrooms that are almost white on the on the edge of the cap here. It'll be kind of like a pinkish whitish color. So it'll always be a, a darker red color over the center, um, fading to a lighter color on the edge. And if you flip it over on the underside, it'll have gills that are attached to the stem that start out kind of a pale gray color and become a darker gray and then transition to this purple, purple gray or purple brown color. And that color changes happening because of the spores maturing um, and developing their color. So this has a purple brown spore print, if you were to take a spore print of it. Another uh, important identifying feature is when it's young, it'll have a really fibrous partial veil. So on the underside, it'll have kind of this cobwebby uh, material covering the gills. And you'll find remnants of that partial veil along the edge of the cap after it's opened up. And you can also find little remnants along the stem, sometimes forming a ring zone. Um, so that's something else, something to look for as well. This one is also a saprotroph growing on dead wood of broadleaf trees. I often find it growing on fallen oak trees. I found this uh, last week growing out of the root ball of a fallen oak. Um, so that's usually where I find it. I think I took this picture in Frick Park a couple years ago. So it's definitely here in our city parks. Um, so beyond having beautiful colors in the daylight, this mushroom is also fluorescent. So I wanted to share some pictures that Alan Rockefeller took. He's a mycologist from California. And to take this picture, he uh, took a UV flashlight and shined it on the mushroom and photographed it 
I think this was like 10 photos um, stacked together to create this, this image. Um, but really stunning colors. Uh, and a lot of the hyphalomas are fluorescent um, in this same way. All right. The next mushroom I wanted to share is Armillaria melia, the honey mushroom. And it used to be that people thought this was one incredibly diverse mushroom that had a whole lot of different ways of growing. Um, but it turns out that what they thought was one species was about 12 different species um, that they've been able to differentiate using um, DNA analysis as well as physical features. Um, so this is the true honey mushroom, um, but there's a number of related species that look pretty similar. So for this one, the features you wanna look for are this really honey colored cap, um, especially when they're young sometimes, they're almost bright yellow. Um, but they can be a little more on the brownish side as well. Uh, when they're wet, the cap will be pretty sticky and they're mostly um, smooth, but there should be some scales or hairs on the cap surface if you look closely. Um, the gills are attached, they're white, and they're covered by a partial veil when they're immature. Um, so again, it's got that cobwebby material on the underside, and um, you can see it leaves a really distinct annulus after that veil breaks up. So as the cap opens up and that veil breaks apart, um, it has a really distinct ring around the stem here. Another thing to note about it is the stem tapers and gets darker as you go down towards the base. Um, so that's another feature to look for. It usually grows in clusters. So when you, if you like pick a cluster, they'll all be kind of fused together at the base and they'll be kind of tapering down and almost kind of pointed at the end of the stem. Uh, another important characteristic to note on this is that it'll have a white spore print. So if you take a spore print of this one, uh, you'll have to put it on some material that will contrast with the white spores. So you could use um, aluminum foil or you could use colored paper um, or anything that's like clear or see-through um, that you could uh, deposit the spores on and then lift up and put on different backgrounds to see the white spores. Um, so that'll help separate this from similar looking mushrooms that maybe would have different colored spore prints. Um, yeah, this one is interesting. It's a necrotroph and a saprotroph. So it will parasitize living trees. Um, it can be pretty damaging to, to living trees. Um, and it also decomposes them after it has uh, killed them. So you'll often find it growing out of the ground from the roots of trees or at the base of a, a dead tree, um, especially like a stump. Um, sometimes you'll find stumps covered in this mushroom. And one lookalike for this one uh, that isn't one of its related species is the funeral bell that we talked about earlier, Gallerina, or Gallerina marginata. Um, but that one has a brown spore print. So that's an easy way to distinguish that mushroom from any of the honey mushrooms Another interesting thing about this mushroom is that the mycelium of it is bioluminescent. So earlier we were talking about the mycelium being these microscopic threads that are um, growing through whatever the fungus is digesting. So if you find um, a log of this that's been infected with this mushroom, um, sometimes that if the mycelium is young and fresh, it will glow in the dark. And that's what people have often called foxfire. If you've ever heard about foxfire, um, 
people are referring to logs that are infected with the mycelium of this mushroom or one of its related species. I believe all of the armillaria species, at least that grow in the east of the Rockies, have bioluminescent mycelium. Sometimes you'll also find these really dark black rhizomorphs, um, which are just like thick strands um, that you can actually see uh, running along wood. Um, and those are often from one of these armillaria species as well. Uh, and that's just a way the fungus gets from one place to another um, and transports nutrients or other uh, materials between different parts of its mycelial network. Um, a related species to, to this honey mushroom here is actually the largest organism on earth. If you've ever heard of the humongous fungus, it's an armillaria mushroom uh, or armillaria fungus that's growing in uh, Eastern Oregon. And it covers some like 4,000 acres and is the largest organism on earth. All right, the next one I wanted to share here is the aborted Entoloma. Entoloma abortivum. And this is a really funky mushroom um, because it has two different forms. So it's a uh, normal mushroom-like form is in this photo. You can kind of see it off to the right here. And there's a smaller one off to the left. There's a couple over in this photo. Uh, and it's fairly nondescript. It's like a grayish, brownish, yield mushroom. Uh, the underside will eventually turn pink. It's got pink spores. And there's really not that much to separate it from other Entoloma species um, that look very similar. But if you find it uh, while it's completing its ecological role as a parasite, you'll find these really strange growths that are these white to brown or pink blobs that are kind of cauliflower-like and spongy. And they're usually growing on or near dead wood. Um, so what's going on here is this fungus is actually parasitizing a um, honey mushroom. So it could be one of the armillaria species or um, there's a ringless honey mushroom that's in a different genus, but it's closely related. And so this Entoloma mushroom will parasitize that honey mushroom. And so this white spongy growth is the aborted honey mushroom. So it never finished growing. It's been parasitized by the mycelium of this Entoloma and it turns into this blob. Um, so kind of cool a fungus that eats other fungi. People also suspect that it's probably a saprotroph um, consuming forest litter as well, um, just like other Entoloma species. They haven't figured out for sure um, if it does that or not, but mycologists think probably. All right, this is a fun one that I wanted to include. Not a super common mushroom, but it has been documented from a city park. I think someone found this in Shenley Park um, last year or the year before. And it's called Witch's Hat. Very fitting for October. Um, Hygrosabe conica. And uh, this is a fairly easy mushroom to identify. Hygrosabe is a genus of mushrooms that are commonly called wax caps or waxy caps. Um, there's a couple related genera as well. Um, and if you were to squish this mushroom between your fingers, it would feel pretty waxy. It would create this kind of waxy substance. Um, it doesn't like break apart uh, into like a really brittle form and it's not really like squishy. So it just kind of forms wax and um, it's got these bright orange colors to red colors, and it'll eventually stain black over time. Uh, and you can actually find mushrooms that are entirely black. So they look pretty much like a witch's hat. 
Um, so that's where the name comes from. And the gills will be kind of the same color as the cap of this mushroom, and they'll also bruise black over time. Um, same with the stem, and the base of the stem is white. So this is an interesting mushroom because the ecology of it is very uncertain. Um, and beyond that, the species uh, definition of this mushroom is uncertain as well. Um, it's been very broadly defined as a very variable mushroom in terms of its ecological role, and there haven't been any good studies done on the DNA of um, specimens of this mushroom that folks have identified as being this species. Um, in fact, this whole genus is not very well studied or understood, and so we'll probably be learning a number of new names for this mushroom in the future um, whenever someone gets to sequencing some specimens of this. Um, so yeah, it's in a lot of field guides um, as Hygrosa biconica, but that name is probably subject to change. I took the picture on the left here over the weekend, growing in a grassy area near a meadow, um, but it can also be found in forested areas. Uh, some people suspect it might be um, associated with moss, so it wouldn't be truly mycorrhizal because moss doesn't have roots, but it could be growing in a symbiotic relationship with moss, um, but sometimes people, people find it growing under conifers like spruce or under broadleaf trees like oak. Um, so yeah, those are places to look for the witch's hat this month if you're interested in finding this mushroom. All right, and then the last species I wanted to share with you uh, is Amanita muscaria. And it's a very iconic mushroom. Um, this is our local version of the iconic red and white um, Amanita mushroom that you've maybe seen referenced in a number of different uh, parts of popular culture. If you've ever played Mario Kart, it's the little red and white mushrooms that are in that. Um, or, you know, a lot of cultural references to, to this particular mushroom. So our local variety is called Gesoei, and it is orange to yellow in color instead of red, but it still has the white warts on top and all of the other features found in the red and white variety that grows in parts of Europe and Asia. Um, yeah, some other interesting or identifying features of this one. Uh, this also has a partial veil on the underside of the cap. Um, so as it uh, opens up, that partial veil will detach from the edge of the cap and leave a ring of tissue around the stem um, that is very skirt-like. So it'll kind of dangle down and look almost like a skirt or a dress um, that the mushroom is wearing on its stem. Uh, and at the base is a bulb. So it, it flares out here in the soil and there will be two or three rings of tissue as you, as you move up from that basal bulb. Um, so when you're identifying Amanita mushrooms, you often have to look at the, the base of the mushroom. Um, sometimes you even have to dig them up out of the soil to really see the features there because that'll help you identify what species it is. Um, this is a toxic mushroom and a hallucinogenic mushroom. Um, so there's a lot of lore around this. Uh, this was often sought out by witches um, for use in their ceremonies. So I thought this was also an appropriate mushroom to feature in this uh, time of the year. It is a mycorrhizal species. So I haven't been able to feature many mycorrhizal species because there just aren't that many that fruit this time of the year. Most mycorrhizal species are found fruiting summer through early fall. Um, and that's because that's when a lot of sugars are available um, while the trees have their leaves on 
they're producing a lot of sugars and sharing that with the fungus. Um, and then the fungus is able to pump some energy into producing reproductive structures. Once we get into the colder part of the year, we see a, a dramatic drop in the number of mycorrhizal species. Um, so this is one of the few that we find through um, mid, middle fall into late fall. And it's uh, widely associated with a number of different trees. Around here, I found it growing under pine, birch, and I think that's it, pine and, pine and birch. Um, but it can also be found under spruce, fir, and aspen trees, among others. All right. So those are all the species I had to share. Um, I'd love to answer any questions that folks have. I think there's some stuff in the chat here. So Stephen, um, we had a question from Robin. Um, can brown rot fungi and white rot fungi both inhabit a log at the same time, or do they tend to compete, keep, compete with each other? They can occupy a log at the same time. But obviously, they would be com uh, somewhat competing with each other. Um, but because they're degrading different compounds in the log, um, they, they aren't like directly competing with each other for, for food resources. Um, and some fungi are even capable of exhibiting both traits. So I think the artist's conch, Ganoderma aplanatum, is capable of both brown rot and white rot. Um, so it's, it's complex for sure. Um, but yeah, great question. And Robin has another one that's come through. Um, what do you know about the invasive Asian beauty fungus? Ah, I, not too much. So the, one of the common names for this is the Asian beauty. Um, the Latin name is Radulomyces coplandii. Um, and there's a couple species of Radulomyces that have been recently discovered in North America. Um, so they're, they used to be, or they're native to parts of Asia um, and have somehow been introduced to North America and uh, have really been rapidly expanding their range. Um, I see them almost everywhere I go now. Um, and that's a relatively recent phenomenon, I think within the past 10 years. Um, so that's about all I know. <laughs> so I think that was everything from the chat. If folks have other questions, they can feel free to put them in now. Here's one from Cheryl. Yeah. So is the bioluminescence of the species to attract spore distributors or is there another purpose? That's a really good question. I was just watching a presentation on this um, the other day and I think the answer is unclear. Uh, one hypothesis is that it could attract um, insects to, to the mushroom um, to consume it and then get spores on them and, and then the insects would fly elsewhere and spread the spores. Um, but there haven't been any studies that have really thoroughly documented that as uh, a, a selective pressure or that would make bioluminescence advantageous. Um, one study that has been done is looking at just like the, the biochemical processes involved in bioluminescence. And it seems that there's a, a good chance that it's just a, a random um, thing that the mushrooms do uh, related to um, their chemical processes in digesting wood. So all of the bioluminescent mushrooms that exist are wood decomposers um, and the chemical pathways to create bioluminescence, I think have some components 
in common with um, the chemical pathways for digesting woody material. Um, so yeah, great question. Do I know why the Ammonita is so popular? Um, I think it's just an incredibly beautiful mushroom. I mean, if you ever stumble upon it in the forest, it is breathtaking. I mean, it's just very large, very bright and colorful. Um, and, and it has a uh, cultural significance for a, a number of people. I mean, there, there are people who use it um, for its hallucinogenic properties. They have ways of preparing it so that it's not toxic. Um, so I, th I think that makes it significant for a number of people. Next question here is, what's your best advice for someone new to seeking out slash foraging mushrooms? Are there any go-to resources so I don't end up in the ER? <laughs> Great question. Um, yeah, I would say, uh, join a mushroom club if, if that's something you're interested in doing. It's definitely the best way to learn about um, what's growing in your area and you'll have the opportunity to go on walks with experts who really know a lot about this subject um, and can give you hands-on um, experience with identifying these in the field. Um, looking at pictures is one thing. Um, it's totally different to be out there um, trying to identify these things. So other than that, I'd say use a lot of the great resources that exist on the internet. Um, there's tons of great YouTube videos uh, and websites that share information for identifying mushrooms. And there's a lot of great field guides out there as well. Um, there's a lot of uh, groups on social media that you could join where you could post pictures of what you're finding to ask for others' opinions. Um, and iNaturalist is a great website and app that you could get, um, which is kind of, kind of the same. Like a lot of people have that and will see things that you post and will comment on there whether they agree on what species it is. And then you can kind of figure out from there whether something is edible or toxic. So Stephen, we have another question from Holly. Is there a program in Pittsburgh where you can bring your collected mushrooms and have them identified? Um, not exactly. So the Western Pennsylvania Mushroom Club meets March through November and, uh, once a month and folks are welcome to bring specimens to those meetings, um, but they've been happening virtually because of the coronavirus. So um, that hasn't really been an option as of late. So you could look for other events where folks might be gathering to, to go out looking for mushrooms or try contacting um, an expert. Um, a lot of people are pretty generous with their time Yeah, all right. I just wanted to share, see if this works. So I do have a couple specimens here. I don't know if folks wanna pull up the, uh, the other video that I started. So this here is one of the other honey mushroom species. So you can see the gills come down the stem a fair amount. Let's 
and they darken towards the base of the stem. Also got the abortive entoloma here. So this is one of the aborted honey mushrooms. It's pretty squishy, pretty tough. And this is like the, um, the normal form. You can see the kind of pinkish color on the gills here. But yeah, just wanted to share a couple specimens before we wrap up here. Could you see the inside of the honey mushrooms? I don't have my knife handy. Um, yeah, sorry, Robin. Cool. Well, yeah, thank you all so much for uh, joining me. I hope you learned a lot. Hope you got excited to head out and look for some mushrooms this fall. And yeah, feel free to email me if you find anything interesting. And if you post stuff to iNaturalist, I'll definitely be looking on there. Um, so yeah, download iNaturalist, post pictures of your mushrooms, and keep in touch. Take care, and I'll see you all out in the parks sometime soon, hopefully.